Representative Scott, uh, House File 291, do you care to move your bill? Uh, yes, I would like to move House File 291, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, to your bill. Uh, members, uh, this November, a Star Tribune reporter uh, came about, upon, came upon some information that um, the suites at the new U.S. Bank Stadium uh, during some of the football games um, and events there, um, that many of the participants that came and occupied those suites were uh, friends and family members and that uh, uh, there was some dispute then whether or not uh, those lists should be made public um, of the people that were attending the suites, um, that were present in the suites uh, during uh, football games and other events. And so what this bill seeks to do is just clarify whether or not uh, those seat lists are public. And uh, with that, I guess I would just offer the bill. And um, it, by the way, it does say that the, those lists should be public if, uh, there were fr if, if the participants were receiving free or discounted admission tickets or other gifts from this publicly owned stadium. Do you have any testifiers? Um, I believe there's one testifier here. Yep. Hello, please state your name to the, uh, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Ealing, Minnesota Coalition on Government Information. Uh, our organization supports the uh, clarity that this bill seeks to bring to HF uh, 1355. That's the section that classifies convention center data. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why um, clarity is useful later on, but I want to talk about the history of the statute first. Uh, you'll see a packet from us um, that has the, uh, the modifications over time that have been made to the statute uh, starting in 1982 uh, up through uh, 2005 was the last time there were modifications. Uh, and you'll see that the statute has always had as a, at its core uh, classifying data relating to the leasing or rental of convention center facilities starting with the St. Paul Civic Center. Uh, so that's been the core function of the, of the statute from the beginning and it seeks to classify certain um, information such as the identity of firms or corporations that contact those <laughs> facilities and the terms of rentals. Um, now setting aside whether that was good public policy or not at the beginning, um, that is the, and always has been the identity or the, 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 the uh, original intent of this statute. What, what's not classified here in a generalized way is whether people have been given free or discounted uh, admission or tickets in any kind of generalized way. That's presumptively public data. Um, so we would welcome um, clarification to that being put into the statute. And the reason why is that if you look at the controversy that's come up around the MSFA uh, and look at the, the history of that controversy, first the Star Tribune uh, asked the MSFA, excuse me, MSFA for the guest lists and they were rebuffed, they were rejected, and they were told that 1355 covered all of the guest list. Uh, then they went back and challenged it, and they were given 99% uh, of the names, uh, and on the list I've seen just two names were withheld for uh, folks that were talking to MSFA for potential future rental purposes. Um, so <coughs> even though that stuff is public data, uh, there is a history within the amendments to the Data Practices Act to if there have been controversies uh, or misinterpretations of the law to then go back and clarify. Uh, so what this would do would be to do that kind of, a, excuse me, that kind of clarification. And you can see this uh, in other parts of the statute. If you, on the back page of our packet in uh, statute 13601, um, there's both uh, call outs for not public data and then clarifications for what data sets are public within that uh, general not public classification. So this has been done from time to time to add clarity and we would welcome that clarity being brought to 1355. I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Ailing, I'm not sure I totally understood what the MSFA's justification was for um, denying in the first place. You had alluded to the fact that 1355 covered everything. Can you re-clarify that? Because I didn't understand it. Oh, That's sure. If you, uh, if you look at some of the data elements that are covered by 1355, um, so there, there's, a, a, there's a couple different subsections. The first subsection talks about the identity of firms and corporations which contact the facility, uh, the types of events they wish to stage, suggested terms of rentals, 
and then there's other sections that deal with uh, other kinds of uh, communications w around rentals of facilities. Okay. And so the, the MSFA initially said, we can't release any names because of this. Uh, then they eventually released most of the names with the exception of two that they identified as being for future rental purposes. I, okay, Representative I get Bush. it now. Because we, the, uh, the data set that we had designated originally under that was not broad enough <coughs> under their interpretation. Is that fair to say? Mr. Eileen. Uh, my, my read of what they tried to do was they tried to read the statute too broadly, and that's where we think clarification is useful. Representative okay. Lech. All right, no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and a uh, uh, question for the testifier. So you had mentioned that of all the list of names for the, the past incident have been released with the exception of two, is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, and Representative Lucero. Mr. Chair, do you, un or uh, testifier or uh, Chair Scott, is it your understanding that they intend to release those two additional names at any point in the future? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe they're saying that those those names will not be released because they were there for marketing purposes. Okay. Uh, Representative Lucero. So the uh, my understanding then of the discussion that just took place, the testimony and uh, Representative Lesh was that they were reading too broad and that even under current language, which the bill seeks to clarify that those names should be released and should not be withheld. Is that my understanding? And thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, uh, I believe it's section one lays out, uh, subdivision one of 1355 lays out carve outs for when um, the names on that list would not be made public. And if those people were there kind of for official business for that they're thinking of renting the facility, US Bank Stadium or any of these other facilities that are publicly owned, um, if they're thinking of renting those, those names would not be released. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and then just one more question then. So if that's the case, if, and I'm not even sure what the totality of the, the number of names that was released, if, if it can by, be by deductive reasoning and that the two were withheld, if that means that they were there for official purposes, can I conclude then that all the names that were released had nothing to do with marketing or official purposes? Representative Scott? Yes, R Mr. Chair, yes, I think you can conclude that. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want some clarification. I think that the information should be public. Um, I have no concern with that. I want clarification about how much is actually going to be um, public. So if someone is granted a discount, um, so if Carlson Company comes in and is going to rent a bunch of suites over time or another Target is going to rent a bunch of suites over time and therefore they are given a discount for their consistent use, then would that list also become public? Or is there another exception under these other lists of exceptions? Because I want to make sure that if uh, folks are getting things for discount or for free, that uh, if we're going to have public information, we should have public information. Representative Scott. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, my understanding is yes, that, that would be made public. If they are getting a discount according to this, this correction of the bill language, they would, that information would be public. Rep Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So then just that that company got it or the list of everybody that attended on behalf of that company because they got discounted tickets? Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to defer to House Research uh, to answer that question because that's a very good question. Mr. Hopkins. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Representative Hillstrom. Um, the bill states that data regarding persons receiving free or discounted admissions, and persons can mean companies or it can mean particular individuals. So I'm not sure if the language of the, on, of the bill on its face uh, provides a clear answer to your question, um, but persons could mean individuals and it could mean companies. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is if so in the event a member maybe works for a company or in the event a member attends with a company, um, I want to know if that's going to be public because at the time there was the controversy about um, who was in those suites. There were photographs of other members sitting on the sidelines. There were photographs of other members in different suites. And I'm just trying to figure out um, if we're going to get the names of everybody. 
Representative Scott. Uh, that is my intent. And so if we need to tighten that language and put individuals and persons, individuals or persons, that would probably do it, Mr. Ealing. Would you agree with that or staff? I think there's two options for further amendments to clarify the language. Uh, one is that you could strike uh, everything starting on 1.5. Uh, the sentence or the partial sentence, it says, unless the data are subject to the provisions of subdivision one. So that would make all information about anybody that got discounted anything public. So that's one option. If folks want to keep to the uh, history of the statute, you could make another uh, very narrow uh, change, which would say, unless the data reveals the identity of a firm or corporation classified by subdivision 1B. So that would tie it to that original data element that just talks about the identity of firms or corporations. So that would further narrow um, that the, the possible universe of, uh, of it information. So either one of those could be done to clarify, depending on what uh, you folks want to do. Representative Hillstrom? I just want a clarification of what she's trying to do, Mr. Chair. I... Mis Mr. Chair? Representative Scott. Thank you. My intention is to make as much public as possible. So if there are representatives of a corporation there that receive free or discounted tickets, those names should be made public, in my opinion. Representative so. Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Scott, so, so I'm looking at this, and this is so broad. I'm sorry? I, I'm looking at this, and this seems so broad. I mean, I'm thinking about the people that run convention centers in Duluth, in St. Cloud, in Rochester, in Moorhead, and civic centers throughout the state. We're now asking their administration to make sure that anybody who gets a discount, that anybody who uh, uh, gets free admission or tickets or things like that as gifts, and and I, I don't I don't know if this even goes so far as if I if if I participate or someone participates in a raffle and receives tickets to an event uh, that that's you know at a public owned facility. I mean, it seems so broad. I get really um, sort of fearful because. The cost that we're going to incur on these people to, to maintain that data in the event that an inquiry is brought forward is, is pretty extreme. And, and I, I think I understand what you're trying to do. I mean, you're trying to get really the sports facility authority and other like agencies in the state to really be on the up and up about what they're doing. And, and, and you're doing it from their side. And I think we all, as elected officials or individuals, we actually have uh, an obligation on our side not to accept gifts, not to accept discounts, not to accept things like that. So, so, so really, I think what your bill is is as much about holding them accountable. It's sort of telling us that we don't have to be accountable unless someone finds out or someone else is, is, is being in charge of that. And then I just want to add, add one more thing. Uh, and it's just a question. Uh, so, so I occasionally go to conventions at facilities that are owned by the city of Minneapolis. And sometimes there's early bird uh, discounts for registering before a certain date. So would that be something that would be disclosed as well? I'm just curious. Mr. Ealing? Uh, Representative Dean, uh, yes, all of that information uh, would be publicly available. And uh, just to give you some background on how the Data Practices Act works is it does have a presumption that all government data are public unless the legislature specifically delineates specific information as not public uh, for a particular reason. And so um, the, the idea that uh, I think that there, there will be additional burden placed on the facility if more data is made public. I would, uh, I would disagree with that just because they already have um, the statute that exists that makes a wide variety of data public. And this is not a, a bigger subset, I would argue. Representative so, so, so sort of two things. I, I hope that when I do an early bird registration for a discount, it actually says early bird registration discount and not just a discount, uh, because I don't want to go up before the ethics committee uh, regarding that. And if it already does it, then, then what, are, what are we doing here? Mr. Ealing. Representative Dean, this is, this is very specifically trying to get to the controversy of MSFA not releasing, uh, or at least attempting not to release already public data. 
And so there has been historical precedent throughout the years of amending the Data Practices Act where there's been a controversy. This, this was done a couple years ago, for instance. So there was a controversy over uh, whether the BCA uh, would release information about the Stingray cell phone tracking device. Uh, and the, the existence of that device at BCA is, is presumptively public. So they have to release it. The fact that they own it, they had to release. Um, but they really resisted it. Uh, it had to go through iPad to get an opinion. The legislature later on clarified the law enforcement data section to say that the existence of that stuff is public. So this is this attempts to fix a similar kind of problem. So Representative Dean. So, so Mr. Chair, I, I would just, as I'm looking at this, I, I, I think I understand the goal and I agree that the Minnesota Sports Facility Authority shouldn't be withholding this information. It shouldn't be a chore to get that information. But, but I, I just don't understand why we're including all convention facilities, all civic centers, and, and the thing that I would also want to ask, it says data regarding persons. I'm assuming that's data specific to this. We're not releasing phone numbers. We're not re releasing addresses. We're not releasing all data regarding these individuals. Mr. Eileen? Uh, Representative Dean, all of that information is already presumptively public uh, with the exception of what's in subdivision one. So again, the identity of a firm that contacts the MSFA, for instance, is, is withheld. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I've got two questions now. I only had one before, but I would have to believe that any discount that's available to the general public is probably not con concerning this data set, correct? Uh, if you get an early bird discount, that's open to the public. We're not concerned with that data, is that correct? Mr. Eileen? Uh, it if, if the MSFA is administering ticket prices, and I don't know exactly their practices, but if that public facility is setting the ticket prices and the discounts, that information would be public. Representative Howe. All right. Uh, the other question I have is I'm a little concerned because I own a business, I own a company. If I go to, the, if I go to this organization and decide I want to rent that then it's, and have a discussion about renting and, and go to the place, then my stuff is withheld just because I'm going there as a as a uh, a company, not a uh, not as a a gift as a member. Mr. Eileen, Representative Howe, that's how the statute currently reads. Mm -hmm. um, again, to back up, if I was sitting here in 1982, I would argue against that um, because it's a public facility. Um, but I, my understanding, the intent of this bill is to clarify what's already in law to ensure that the maximum amount of public information is released. So that's, that's what this is trying to get at. Representative Howe? Well, thank you, but it, I, for me, I don't know why we withhold that information either, but that's, that's fine. And we have uh, four um, more questions and 10 minutes left, so if we could be brief, uh, that would be appreciated. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, uh, <clears throat> um, Representative <laughs> Scott, I wonder if you would entertain a friendly amendment. Perhaps. Representative Scott? Perhaps. Representative right. I'm looking for on line 1.15 to strike R in both locations and insert is. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Scott? Um, I think I would find that as a friendly amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Representative Scott. The, um, the consistent use of R um, Mr. Ailing is like fingernails on a chalkboard to me. It's like Superman and kryptonite. I just can't handle it. So thank you very much, <laughs> Representative Scott. Uh, Ms. Christensen's presence here notwithstanding. <clears throat> She's a big fan of the R. I know. <laughs> I mean, I would note also, Mr. Ailing, that uh, when you use the word information, you said is as the singular, but when you said data, you said R. The justification for most people I talk to say that because data in its Latin version was in the plural. She already said yes. Huh? She already said yes. I know that, but I'm kind of pontificating. <laughs> Representative Lesh. I gotta pontificate. But I would just note simply, Ms. Chair, you have questions. That that information or informatio is a Latin root also. Okay, I'll, I'm, done. I'm done. Thank you, Representative Lesh. Okay, Representative so, Johnson. So, but, but, but I did have a question. I did have a question. Okay. Representative Lesh. <clears throat> a real question. Briefly, please. Okay, thank you. So, uh, admission. Does ev is everyone who's admitted to a facility like this, um, is, is that so 
let's say, someone who was there to do a job, sing the national anthem or something. I mean, I think Peggy Flanagan sang the national anthem at a Twins game or something, as I recall. Um, are, are we intended to include those people if, they, if they're in and out? Uh, Mr. Eileen. If, uh, if there's a record of that information, say they have a record, uh, like this would cover the deck, for instance, say the deck up in Duluth wanted to hire somebody to come sing the national anthem, yeah. and they have records that say who that is, that would be public information and would fall outside of this uh, particular statute and be presumptively public. Okay. All right. Thank you. Representative Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And briefly, I've, um, Representative Scott, if a legislator, I guess anybody else, um, was invited to a corporate suite um, where a regular person wasn't typically allowed to go to um, and had that opportunity, would that be part of the, the data that would be available? Mr. Eileen. Uh, yes, that would be public information. Representative Scott. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. We're talking here specifically about the suites that the Sports Authority, the, Minis the MSFA, um, they control these two suites. And so we're saying that, that those lists are the ones that would be made public. If a corporation owns a suite, uh, my understanding is that they're, it's n they don't have to release who their guests are at any given event. Is that what you're getting at? Representative Johnson? Well, that's unless they got a deal. Well, if someone's getting a special deal at one of these events, that my understanding is you, you want to make sure that data is available. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is that, am I getting at? Mr. Eileen. What your intent is here? Yeah, the, uh, to clarify, this would apply to publicly owned facilities, so mm -hmm. the, the publicly <clears throat> managed and owned boxes that the MSFA, excuse me, MSFA controls or say, you know, even the Burnsville Arts Center, if they're giving discounted admission, all of that would be a public data, and it already is public data, but this clarifies that it remains public data. Re Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It was a, a quick follow-up to Representative Dean's uh, questioning, but I think Representative Howe touched on that, and that is, <laughs> I think the focus of this effort is uh, to bring sunlight into access that the general public does not have, uh, rather than the, the early bird discounts that, that, that everybody would have available to them. And so, but again, it was, it was uh, touched on already by Representative House. Thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering <clears throat> if nonpartisan staff could actually go through what, because it says in the, the new statute or the new um, language that it's the data is subject except for under provision, subdivision one, excuse me, the provisions under subdivision one. And I'm wondering if they could go through since subdivision one isn't included in this language, what the subdivision one exclusions include? Mr. Hopkins. Because that seems to be the question that we've asked a million times and maybe they could just clarify. Mr. Hopkins. Mr. Chair and members, subdivision one of 13.5 provides that generally speaking, um, data which pertain to a negotiation, an ongoing negotiation for rental of a facility will be non-public. Um, the reason for that is that if Billy Joel is looking to rent a publicly owned and operated stadium, um, the facility might not want uh, that the negotiations to be public so that a another facility or institution could be aware of exactly what kind of prices they're charging and come in just under uh, their quotes. So subdivision one says it lists some specific information that would be non-public. Um, uh, subparagraph A says a letter or other documentation from any person who makes an inquiry to or who is contacted by the facility regarding the availability of the facility for staging events. Um, B is the identity of firms and corporations which contact the facility. C is the type of event which they want to stage in the facility. D is the suggested terms of rentals. And E is the responses of authority staff to those inquiries. So generally speaking, we're talking about data or information that the entity maintains as part of a negotiation for rental of the facilities. Now, under subdivision two of 13.55, those data aren't not public forever. Subdivision two provides that after five years from the date on which the contract for rental, uh, after five years of, from that date, the data become public. Also, if the um, 
contract doesn't actually occur and there is no rental contract signed, uh, the event which was the subject of the inquiry, the proposed date for that event, after that happens, uh, the data would become public. And under C, uh, the event, if the event which was the subject of the inquiry or the negotiations, if it occurs elsewhere, um, then of course the negotiations are over, they've terminated, and the data regarding the negotiations would become public. So the data that are made not public under subdivision one of 13.5 aren't not public forever. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, hopefully that clarifies what is and what is not under this. Yeah. And as a reminder, this bill is going to state gov finance and the author is amenable to uh, making any changes or recommendations. A closing, a brief comment, Representative Dean? Uh, just, just, just to clarify in response to uh, Representative Lacerno's comment, I think you're right. I don't think that that's the intent of this, but I think it's written so broadly that it would encompass me getting an early bird discount. And, and I would hope that the author, before this moves forward, would begin to sort of parse out some of those specific things relative to this bill. Representative Scott, closing comments? Um, yeah, I just appreciate your support on the bill. We'll tweak the language as needed. And I just want to clarify what Representative Johnson's question was. I know he's left now. But I think what he was getting at is if there's a corporate suite and you're invited to the corporate suite as a legislator, um, by that corporation, um, that is not public data. That's, that suite is not the same thing as the publicly controlled suites that we're talking about here in this bill. If that and clarifies. Representative Hillstrom, a just, closing brief comment? Just to that point, I think the way it's drafted, if that corporate suite got a discount, I think it would be subject. And so I think we need to look at the data. Representative Scott? Very fine. With that, Representative Scott renews her motion. House File 291, <clears throat> excuse me, be re-referred to the State Gov Finance Committee. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion carries. Aye.